Yeah, so it's anyone who accesses the services through the Liverpool Women's. So um, ideally, we are aiming for those women who book for their pregnancy care at the Women's, but in any pathway of care. So in the community, book for home birth, but as long as Liverpool Women's is their uh, hospital. I guess what we, the, the women that aren't captured by that are those women who were referred in from other hospitals because of the high risk nature of their pregnancy mm. at some point after the first trimester. We'd like to be as inclusive as possible. So we won't be turning anyone down. Um, so open to all, over 16, book for care at the women's, you can take part, in, and your first ongoing pregnancy, you can take part in Siegel. So one explanation is, is about reassurance that your identity will be unseen by anyone analyzing the data. Uh, the other is the opportunity that you have to be part of mobilizing the data to work harder for your child and your family. And there might be some, we might actually put some examples mm. of the benefits that are being delivered now, particularly in the Cypher program, um, which makes it just normal to use data in this way. So it's not something special that we're doing because of Siegel. Siegel's making use of something that's core business to running a better NHS in Liverpool. I mean, some of the things that I think people will be anxious about, Amy, are will you sell our data? No, we won't. Um, will anyone be able to identify you know, personal things about me from the data? Mm -hmm. No, they won't be able to. These are all, I think these are really valid questions um, because a lot of people are very sensitive now to the fact that data can be misused. We see examples of that all the time. Only yesterday my credit card was skimmed for about the third time this year. Um, you know, the misuse of data and personal information is, is everywhere. Um, but the reality is that people share far more on their Facebook page in any given week than we will be taking in terms of you know, identifiers, et cetera, and it will all be done in a very uh, protected way. Um, so that, I think it's a really valid question. We've put a lot of thought into how to broach this with, with participants, and we haven't bottomed it out completely yet. Um, but I, a lot of it is about reassurance, trust, and the fact that um, participants in this study will own their data and their samples. They're gifting custodianship to us, but in an anonymous way. No, so that's a really good point, right? Because um, taking part in this study, um, initially in pregnancy, it's going to be very um, convenient for women to take part because they're coming for care to the women's anyway. Um, and so it's, it's not massively inconvenient but there is a long-term commitment to this study. And anyone who's had a two-year-old will know that um, being asked to take a child for a developmental assessment when you're already in the middle of a busy working day is, an, is a nightmare, <laughs> quite frankly. So uh, we're not going to incentivize the study financially in terms of paying people to take part, but we do want to compensate them and make it as easy as possible. The second reason for doing that is because um, some of the people that we most want to reach are those women who will be least likely to take part because of their personal circumstances, because they are already they already lack agency, they already are marginalised, they live in difficult to reach communities, and so we want to spend a particular amount of effort and time making sure that no one is disadvantaged to the point that they can't take part in this study. So we've thought about how to take the study to them and also how to compensate those mums and as the children grow the kids for their time. Because time is, time is money. Um, so fortunately, that work is in progress because obviously it's a few years yet before the, the kids will be, it's a year or so yet before the kids will be coming. Um, but we have thought a lot about it. It's a, it's a really valid question. So um, again, really good question. So some of the biological things that we're most interested in, um, uh, such as the pregnancy complications of hypertension, preeclampsia, growth restriction, preterm birth, they predominantly, not exclusively, but they predominantly affect first pregnancies. 
if you've had an uncomplicated first, and the midwives and doctors in the audience will know this, if your first pregnancy was okay, the likelihood is you'll be fine in your second and third and fourth pregnancy. Sadly, not always, but in general. The first pregnancy is the, the sort of marker, not only of your reproductive history, but also for a mum, her later, re, her later uh, health. So we know that if you have, for example, high blood pressure in your first pregnancy, you're more likely to have high blood pressure after the menopause. First pregnancy is a real... It's actually been called um, the stress test for, for women. It's the equivalent of putting a 25-year-old woman on a treadmill and doing a cardiac stress test. We can get as much information about her cardiac health from that first pregnancy than you can do from doing all the lab investigations. Um, so that's why we're concentrating on first-time mums. But obviously, first-time mums have second babies and third babies. And our plan is that we will recruit families as the study progresses. Because what happens, I mean, I'm a middle child. I'm a classic middle child in my complex family. Um, and we know that birth order counts. So as the study evolves, we want to actually collect data from siblings and from um, you know, modern family co constructs as well, which have changed completely in the last 10 years. So that's all in plan. It's just not an immediate focus right now. But again, excellent question. We don't want to exclude second and third time moms from taking part. They will get their chance, but we'd really like them in their first pregnancy. And some of the linked data will be, we'll be able to use to study mm. other subsequent pregnancies, birth order effects, there'll be a lot of thinking about cleaning up and linking further the relevant data. Um, to a colleague earlier as well, I'm, I was just conscious of the amazing opportunity that you have to convey messages at a really important time in a woman's life and family's life of the great opportunities that we would like to put more into public health policies, learning by play, brain development, that is such a wonderful investment in life. There's an increasing amount of work by the people who study health data uses in triggering information to raise awareness about those opportunities at the individual family level for a connected world. So. I think we can bring those through as, look, you've got not only those who are taking data out and doing their usual research, but you've got people whose research is trying to make data work harder for individuals and communities. And yeah, you, thank you. That was a very helpful comment. We will work on that. So other studies have looked at this, have looked at attrition rates. So um, obviously the studies that I'm referring to are now at least 15 years old. Uh, some of them are older than that. And it does vary from country to country and from region to region. And it also varies from study to study. So studies that are, bizarrely, studies that are a bit lighter in their touch, they're just data and they're infrequent in terms of their touch points with um, participants, they actually have higher attrition rates. Studies like ours, which are quite intense, where you get to know mums very early in their pregnancy and follow them up intensely, they have low attrition rates because mums feel invested in the study, they've already committed time and energy, they, want, they know the team, they want to know how it works out. So, but attrition rates do accrue for various reasons as families move, grow, change or leave the region. So we think that there'll be low enough attrition rates from the overall study. We factored on about 10%, maybe a little bit more by the time the children are five. Within that, some mums may say, well, I'll stay in the study, but I don't want to do this follow-up, or I don't want my kid to have this developmental assessment, or we're leaving for two years to go and live in Dubai, we'll be back in three years. There'll be you know, a, a mixture of things. For those mums that leave the region and want to uh, take part, um, we want to keep them in the study. And this is where we think the data linkage will actually keep pace with our demand. You might want to say something about that, Ian, because yeah. what we're doing regionally is really special at the moment, but thanks to Ian, it will be national quite soon. With, with consent, uh, you, you have the ability to follow people's records. In England, the GP records, hospitals, admissions, discharges, procedures, um, and to, to some extent, social care contacts when they're more easy to link. Uh, we can follow someone if they move out of area. We also have a family of Cypher-like programs. So there's something called the Cypher Expansion Program. It's in 11 integrated care system areas at the moment. 
um, the way of working is becoming normal, so the data are getting more linked and more detailed and more used. So the hard questions we ask of the data that we have nicely linked and ready in and around Liverpool, the ability to do that in other areas is increasing because of this cipher expansion program. So yeah, we've got the permission, mm -hmm. and we'll we'll have better data and means of accessing the data. I think it's worth flagging as well that one special thing about Li Liverpool, uh, there are many special things about Liverpool, but one very special thing about Liverpool that makes the cohort feasible is that there's very little immigration and emigration within the city. Um, people do come here and they like to stay. I mean, you know, I went to medical school here and I'm from Liverpool. I grew up here and I went to medical school here, but all the guys and girls I live with at medical school were from outside the city. None of them wanted to leave. It's a sticky place. Once you get here, you like it. You kind of get the vibe and you want to stay. That's culturally really important for our birth cohort because in other cities they have transient populations. Trying to do this in London would be really difficult because it's a very migratory city and uh, families tend to leave London as soon as they're a family because of afford, you know, affordability of housing and schooling and things. So again, in our pitch to welcome when we said we want to do this in one single place, um, I think the expert peer reviewers who read the application understood that Liverpool's a special place to do this. You know, I know I keep saying that, and I'm clearly biased, but we certainly managed to convince international peer reviewers who are quite hard-nosed mm -hmm. that actually that, that's the case. So we're hoping for low enough attrition rates, um, and that if you do leave for whatever reason, if you leave our amazing city for some mad reason, you can still take part in, in our study. Oh, no, multiple pregnancies too. Yeah, so mul multiple pregnancies um, are absolutely... Um, welcome to take part and I mean there, there are very very few exclusion factors um, inability to give informed consent and for safeguarding reasons because of the nature of dynamic consent we're not recruiting under 16 year olds but um, because of great work from our public health colleagues there aren't very many under 16 year olds in Liverpool anyway which is something that we're quite proud of <laughs> one of the reasons I think welcome chose Liverpool as he had an answer to the question, um, which we put into action in our COVID responses. The next phase of that, um, which will become apparent with the work on mental health, is to have just enough information extraction from hospitals that currently doesn't get into integrated records that uh, you can reuse in other hospitals. Let's say I want to deploy natural language processing across clinical notes to classify a fuzzy concept like sepsis, or to say in a psychiatric note, why wasn't that medicine prescribed? To get the nuance that is trapped at the moment and is not researchable, uh, many of those cases have a, a crying need to deploy that for better care reasons. So we're bringing the research conversation for information extraction along uh, with the service conversation so we've deliberately embedded all of the research functions for the Cypher program as core business in the NHS. And this is a, a program now with our integrated care system um, to say what, what next, but not wait till the perfect system's built. You start with the actions that need to be taken and you keep pulling through. And that accelerates things, because if, you, if you've done that processing of clinical notes once, those technologies, you, pretty much cookie cut that and apply them somewhere else. And, and we've also thought about what happens when you get um, data from like a hospital admission, like a weight that's actually different to what we know happened in the GP surgery only a day before, out by three kilos, you know, kids have not lost three kilos overnight. So what do we do about, you know, inconsistent data? What do we do about missing data um, when things that are in the EPR are not um, collected, you know, collected as they should be, and that's, you know, that's something we've looked at in the antenatal space as well as thinking about what happens when kids go into the postnatal child and then adolescent. Um, but as Ian says, if we waited, this is where it's a classic example of perfection is the enemy of good. If we sat and waited for the perfect system, we'd probably still be talking at the turn of the next millennium. So we're going to crack on in the expectation that um, it can only get better. But actually. Um, I mean, every, every hospital is different, every EPR is different, but looking at the EPR and the women's, 
um, we've been really pleasantly surprised at the quality of the data, the lack of missingness, um, what we'll be able to get from that data to the point that actually we're now thinking that we've got much more time to do extra special stuff that would be outside of the mainframe of what's in the electronic record because we can rely with a high degree, um, with, to a very high degree, on the electronic data. Um, now, it, that's going to be variable, but it just is what it is. Um, but it's a great question and something that keeps us awake at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, and you've raised a point that se Seagull is, is a pathfinder, really, for mm -hmm. taking the data we think are underused, mm -hmm. and they're already coded, as, as you've described, and they could flow very easily. It's just about prioritising turning that pipe on and quality assuring it into an integrated care record. And we do want to talk to stakeholders in various, but Alder Hay being the most imminent after the wins, because you probably have about eight research questions now that you think we could do this. So let us know, because it won't be long before that first kid is coming through the doors of Alder Hay. It seems like it's, it feels like it's years, years away, but actually from the minute we recruit, you're potentially about nine months away from that first kid walking through the door or being carried through the door of Alder Hay. We have spent so long thinking about this because it's so important. You know, I think I started with the example of the Framingham Heart Study to illustrate what happens when the cohort doesn't look like the population you seek to serve. If you miss women out of a cohort, you're going to not serve women. You know, that's a huge example, and you know, it's easy to point to it because it's a set, you know half a century old now. Um, but we need the cohort to look like Liverpool, so we know what Liverpool looks like, and we know where those those precious areas are where women who already lack agency or are hard to reach, who are already feel marginalised and are, are the least likely to take part in the study, are the ones that will probably spend the most time trying to engage and keep involved. So uh, Christine may want to say a bit more about this, but language should not be a barrier. We're getting a whole heap of materials with, tran with bespoke translational services. We're doing a, a lot around community engagement with cultural leaders and um, thinking about how we can reach those communities that would traditionally not take part in voluntary research like this. The women um, that I, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, are those women who are divided from research because of their socioeconomic status. More than anything in Liverpool, I think that's where the biggest divide is. Um, and, you know, saying to um, someone, and this is going to get worse because of where we're heading economically, um, but saying, can you come to the women's when you live in Kirby and you don't actually have enough money to get the bus to the local food bank? It's not going to happen, right? It's just not going to happen. So we need to take the study to those women and we need to make sure that we've put in all the things that those women tell us they need in order to take part. Not a bunch of us theorising in the hospital, what if we do this, this and this? So what we're, we're doing engagement with those communities and asking, how can we make it easier? What are the barriers? Tell us what you need. Um, and that's a work in progress, but I th we've done a lot of work around that. Well, safeguarding issues trump research, essentially. So there are very clear um, signposted pathways of care that are nested within, within the study protocol, uh, but also mirror what we would do as a standard of care within the NHS. Uh, but absolutely, yeah, we will, we will Hopefully, hopefully it won't be too frequently, but the reality is it will happen. Um, and so that's been thought through and safeguarding issues <coughs> always trump anything that we, we might want to do research-wise. The safety of, uh, of women and their, um, the safety of our participants, women and their children, uh, is paramount. I was only having this conversation last week, I, I, and Ian's had me say this before, but, uh, and again, I say this as a, as a Liverpoolian, I think Liverpool is a really matriarchal society. If you want to get something done in, in a community in Liverpool, ask a grandma, because <laughs> she, she will do it. Um, so absolutely, it's, there needs to be a level of community engagement which is bespoke for various, you know, because we're not all one homogenous clan. We like to think we are, and certainly when it comes to football, we're two clans. Mm -hmm. But w we, we know that there are cultural sensitivities that, um, that vary even between postcodes. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a, quite a lot of thought that's gone into that, um, particularly for women who may not feel they've got agency to take part. How do we engage a family? Because it's a family study after all. And that may well be her partner, her mother-in-law, her own mum. So that, that work has been done. 
um, and we'll see how it goes. I won't ask you about the data and the desktop because that's something else we'll look at later. <laughs> yeah. But the social network information would, would be great yeah. to collect in detail. That, that, that is work in progress. It's, it's quite hard. But the very strong social structures mm -hmm. in Liverpool and the way they can create alternative pathways you know, I, I was one of those kids born in poverty in 1967 by statistics, but I was just lucky. I had a very pushy nan who See taught, what I say? <laughs> yeah, taught me to read and write and do arithmetic before I went to school. So that divergence, we need to be able to understand the, the contrasts um, and the, we, we are puzzling quite a bit uh, how we get a detailed social structure information for the journey. I think it comes back to though Sandos being able to explain what we really hold true, that this study is from Liverpool, it's not from us, um, because uh, with the, if all goes according to plan, I will have handed this over to other, we all will have handed this study over to other researchers in a few years time, because this will go on beyond my retirement. Um, which may be sooner than you know I plan. So it, this isn't about the researchers. It's not even about the university. This is about a resource from Liverpool, predominantly for Liverpool, but it's also a gift to the world. And I think if we can really embed that in um, in the wider community, then we're, we've we've well we've already won. Uh, absolutely, we are future-proofing it for everything that you can think of in terms of epigenetic uh, exploration, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, omics in the round. So uh, antenatally, uh, we're taking 35 mils of blood from mums at two time points. Um, we're taking whole blood for DNA extraction and RNA extraction. It's quite expensive, but we are committed to doing the RNA. Um, and we're storing serum and plasma. Um, there's still a little bit of wiggle room around what media we store on because for proteomics and um, metabolomics there's still a bit of there's still a bit of debate as to whether it should be citrate or EDTA or you know lithium heparin um, but we want to make sure that we try and get the most user-friendly sample um, and then in, t in terms of babies we're taking cord blood and placenta um, then what we do with babies and DNA afterwards is really tricky because a previous cohort that I've worked with has taken saliva DNA from babies, but actually they don't actually have DNA in their saliva when they're first born because they don't actually shed skin cells. <laughs> uh, so we need to think about doing the saliva collection probably at the first follow-up, um, which won't be for several months when they do actually have squames in their, in their, um, in their mouth. We've given a lot of thought as to when we can next collect blood from babies, um, toddlers and, and um, five-year-olds, because that's a big ask. I mean, if anyone's ever taken a two-year-old for a blood test, you'll know that's a huge ask. So we may well do that on sub on sub studies, perhaps a small uh, a small group of babies who were particularly interested in like gr very severe growth restriction or very preterm babies. Um, but we're harmonising the uh, collection standards to Elspeth, <coughs> to um, Born in Bradford, and to um, some of the more modern cohorts internationally. So everything will be future-proofed. If there's an epigenetic question you want to ask, we should have the resource to answer it. And we're working with the Sangha on... Um, on a, we, we started to work with the Sangha, and they've offered to do a whole exome and GWAS at knockdown rates. So we, we hope to get... Um, archive, GWAS, or whole exome, and then it's the data that you'll be accessing, not the samples, because we'll, make the, we'll share the data freely. And an integrated computational resource as well. So if you're playing around to try and get a more articulate longitudinal phenotype from the data, uh, you don't want to have to have then a long barrier to connecting it with the molecular data. Mm. We want to try and make that discovery process highly integrated. It's just scary when you think about the um, the quantity of data, though, Christian. It's like terabytes of data, um, and then you think about doing that 30,000 30, times over. Um, yeah, something else I think about at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, obviously, patient care always comes first, um, and so if, if we're doing delayed cord camping and the cord is empty, it's empty, and we won't be able to collect cord blood. 
Yeah, absolutely. We'll be able to, so if they have routine, and well, there's nothing routine about a blood test on a two-year-old, as you can know, but uh, if they have clinical care and a blood test, for example, you know, an insulin level measured or um, a vitamin level measured or a full blood count to investigate for anemia, we'll be able to access that data uh, because it's done in this region. In parallel, a colleague who's not here today, um, who we recruited to the university last year, um, a colleague of ours called Richard Sofat, who's head of, she's a, a, a physician um, and is head of our Department of um, Pharmacology. Richa and um, Munir P. Mohammed, another colleague of ours, are thinking, um, well, they're beyond thinking, they're planning a new um, open access resource called Liverpool and Me, which basically does exactly what you're sort of referring to, which is when you come in through the doors of Luft and eventually all of our hospitals and you have a routine blood sample taken for anything, you'll sign a form that says you can have what's left and it will become a living open door revolving biobank. Now that is a separate piece of work that obviously with my day job head on, I'm passionately supporting and Ian's doing a lot of the prep around that as well. Um, if that comes on stream, then we will have that because it's, it's live in the system. Um, so at the moment, we're only able to get the data from those samples, but I hope in pretty short order, we'll be able to get residual samples as well that will form part of the living biobank. And that negates the need then to actually routinely bleed children because it's a horrible thing um, and I you know I'm with you I wouldn't have taken my kids for a blood test unless there was a clinical indication because they were boys and they would you know do that thing of where they lie on the floor and scream and yeah and that's when in their 20s <laughs> also back to the connected world and if you can if the sample is an experience if you're asking people questions about um, their observations of symptoms might be uh, wheeze patterns in their child, then variability can tell us more than the mean. So we might have these research visits here and here with really clean data, but it doesn't tell us that phenotype that's going like that from that and the phenotype that's going like that. You've got to tap into the rhythms of life. And as health apps become more usual, and we're doing a big piece in mental health that we we, we can't achieve without gathering people's experience from daily life. We'll spot those variabilities through questions and answers that learn not to annoy someone so that they do respond to the question, but ask frequently enough to spot the changes over time that signal something that's important to discovery. There are also an opportunity of heads up, you, you might want to go and see services for another sample because you're in this cohort study. And we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. That's not in scope. We don't have the resources to do that, but we'd like to be able to do that. And one final thing I'll just mention um, on the foot of that, Ian, is um, obviously we are moving into a, a you know a technical age. And I used my watch to board a plane the other day for the first time ever. I felt so sophisticated showing mm -hmm. my. Um, but um, we know from our experiences in COVID that um, despite the fact that the population were predominantly reaching out to being young um, and usually very tech savvy and early adopters of disruptive technology. We know we've got big problems in Liverpool with digital poverty. And again, a lot of the, uh, those women that are hard to reach um, and just haven't got access to apps, won't be able to do that two-way data collection. So anything that's absolutely essential for the study will not depend on access to the internet or access to a smartphone or access to an app because uh, I think that's kind of actually a bit exclusive and, and that's not what we want. So uh, it's, an, it's a really valuable additional resource, but it's not fundamental to the platform of Seagull. We want everyone to be able to take part, whether you've got an Apple phone, or Android or whatever, no phone at all, you can still take part in Seagull. Hmm. But if a philanthropist came along and said... Here's 10,000 smartphones, yep. we'd say yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So late bookers are important for different reasons because, again, talking about those women that are hard to reach, some women, the women who lack agency, et cetera, you do find that they're overrepresented in the cohort of women who book late. And, and they're important to us. So we're being a bit flexible about the you have to book at 11 weeks and if we don't get the first set of blood samples, you can't take part. That's not the case. We, we want to be able to recruit. 
really at any point in pregnancy. Ideally early, but that's not necessarily a given because we, again, want to be inclusive rather than exclusive. Um, and in terms of the, you know, how do we identify a baby who's growth restricted? Um, that's going to actually for us be a postnatal diagnosis anyway. The personalised growth charts are brilliant, and they've, trans they've tr uh, transformed care. You know, of, of you know, in terms of identifying those babies that are potentially at risk. But we'll use exactly the same algorithm just on the birth weight and the mum's personalised data to delineate those babies that we think are small, you know, abnormally small, as opposed to just constitutionally small. So we'll use the same software package actually in the in the cohort, and. When all said and done, we'll have the raw data anyway. So if the algorithm changes, and it, it does from time to time, because the perinatal institute often put out a new algorithm, we'll we'll have the raw data anyway. So we can always we can always just redo the numbers and identify small babies based on a new algorithm. And our study will create a new growth reference. Yeah, that's this, relevant this to the Liverpool. context of Liverpool. Yeah. Because at the moment, you know, we're using national um, national data, which is great, but you know, this is going to be hyper hyper regional. So hair's really interesting, right? It's not just um, uh, it's not just like dead cells or whatever we were taught at medical school. It's actually a biorepository in itself. So um, we and we know that now because um, because of a certain athlete called Lance Armstrong. <laughs> So, um, Lance Armstrong, so this is a true story, he figured out before most um, clinical pharmacologists that actually hair was a really good repository for drugs, for drug analysis. So I don't know if you remember back in the days when we thought he was a good guy, he got the postal team, his, um, his cycling team mates, to shave their heads uh, and in fact total body shave. Now he said that was because they were aerodynamic on the bike, so they were waxed and shaved to within an inch of their lives. But when their hair started to come through, and they look a bit like mine, he got them to bleach it. Because if you bleach hair, it bleaches out all of the drug metabolites. And he kept saying, it's, it's a team thing, that's why we've all got this bleach short hair. But he was just evading the, the drug detectors. Very, I mean, say what you will, but very, very clever, right? <laughs> so, um, but in addition to drugs, actually, hair is really good at looking at the air quality you've been breathing over the previous three or four months. It's really good at looking at stress levels. It, essentially, all the metabolic signatures in your body play out in the hair. And you can see it temporally. So the hair that's furthest away from the root tells you what was happening two years ago, nine months ago, three months ago. It's a really good biorepository. It's also really stable. So if you take a few uh, bits of hair, you can keep it at room temperature, whereas everything else we take has to be spun in a lab and then frozen. So Modern cohorts are now taking hair. Um, it's difficult in a birth cohort because, you know, I've been a 20-odd-year-old mum myself and um, I'm not sure I would have liked someone to snip a bit of my hair. I'm not bothered these days, as you can tell. <laughs> but, but back in the day, taking a bit of it, it's a big ask, right? I think some women will feel more precious about giving a lock of their hair than they will about um, giving blood. And we've asked this in focus groups, you know, how would you feel about... Yeah, so she needs to be willing, and if she's not willing, that's fine. You know, we're not we're not going to tie her down to take her hair. Um, and then if it's if it's a whole head bleach, um, with, you know, whole root bleach, then uh, it's probably of limited value. But if it's actually, uh, I know a lot about this, low lights or highlights, then you can actually avoid the the bleach bit and just take the the natural hair piece bit. And we actually only need a tiny bit; it's not a huge amount. Um, but it's not a deal breaker. You know, actually none of the samples are deal breakers. What we really want are women just to take part um, and get the data. The biological samples is the cherry on the cake and it matters enough, you know, enormously to us, but it's not a deal breaker. We don't want anyone to feel excluded. Great question to end on. And I know we've massively overrun and I'm so sorry, but thank you so much for all your enthusiasm and for the questions. And um, we'll be back again to update soon. So thank you very much.